Good morning, everyone. Hello, hello. I know that last week we had some techie issues with the sound. Hopefully everything is just perfect today. Um, but be sure to let me know in the comments if there's anything off. Um, I am Tina Swithin, author of Divorcing a Narcissist, founder of One Mom's Battle, and the High Conflict Divorce Coach Certification Program, where I teach people to take the lemons that life has given them and make lemonade to help others. Um, I'm also the creator of Family Court Awareness Month. I am not an attorney. I cannot give you legal advice. Um, we are very much a group of survivors, lemonade warriors, um, who come together with collective wisdom and talk all things narcissist and family court. Always check with your attorney on anything you plan to do as they are your voice in the courtroom. And speaking of, if you are in need of an attorney or a a therapist for yourself or your children, be sure to check our database, uh, friendsofomb.com. And if there's someone who you think is just amazing who needs to be added to that database, be sure to let us know that as well. You can email friendsofomb at gmail.com. Good morning, Gigi. Heading to the mountains 46th birthday. That's so exciting. That it happy, happy, happy birthday. Um, you're just about a year behind me. Um, yeah. And so I just spent, I went kind of off. I, I did a little staycation in our RV and worked on my first book, Divorcing a Narcissist, um, One Mom's Battle, because I am basically rewriting the whole thing. Um, back when I wrote it in 2012, I was taking a huge risk. I was still under the microscope of family court. Um, and there were a lot of family court professionals who held my children's, you know, livelihood in their hands. And so I had to be more filtered than I would like to be. Um, and so I'm going back and I'm rewriting quite a bit of it, but I'm also sharing the ending um, of our story, which um, for those of you who have followed along, um, came to a complete end recently. So very grateful for that and um, hoping to have it out by February. So stay tuned on that. Um, good morning, everyone joining us. Um, I do have an announcement. I think we may be switching Coffee with Tina to Instagram. I know, Gigi, you don't have Instagram. Um, I'm wondering if maybe you'd get it. Um, I, for a variety of reasons, um, we may be doing that in January, but no final decisions have been made yet, so I'll keep everyone posted where we go with that, but it is something that we are talking about a little bit behind the scenes. So I'm going to jump into today's questions. Um, the first one is, what things to discuss with minors counsel regarding um, keeping monitored visits? How? What can I say to prove that there is no... Um, alienation. Um, basically that you're encouraging a relationship um, between the unhealthy parent, you know, given you have monitored visits. Um, congratulations. First of all, we all know how difficult those are to obtain um, and then how difficult they are to hold on to. You know, I'll tell you in my situation, everyone told me um, you'll never get supervised visits. And, you know, I call them like my blinders. I put on my negativity blinders and I refused to listen to anybody tell me um, what I couldn't, couldn't do. You know, obviously there's reality comes into play, but I refuse to allow those negative comments in. 
And, and so I just kept plugging forward. I knew my ex-husband was a candidate uh, for supervised visits um, and, and we would obtain them. But what I found is that they don't, you know, they use supervised visits a lot of times as kind of a slap on the hand. Don't do that or look what we can do. And so it, when we started supervised visits, um, like so many others, we ended up on a roller coaster of that in itself to where they would give him supervised visits for a month at a time, three months at a time, and then they would say, hey, you know, let's try this again. And then they would give him unsupervised access. Um, once I did obtain supervised visits for a more permanent, you know, longer duration. Everybody said, yeah, but this is only temporary. They'll never do it permanently. Again, I put on my negativity blinders. I'm like not listening to this. And sure enough, um, I was able to obtain permanent professionally supervised visits um, in a permanent final. I don't think anything is truly final in family court until those babies age out of the system. But um, we did get a final custody order for permanent supervised visits. So, you know, keep your negativity blinders on. Keep going forward. You know, you have to be realistic. You have to, you know, um, be aware of all things family court potential, um, who the players are, all of that. But, um, you know, keeping that is is the goal, you know. And so for me, if I were in your shoes, um, what things can we show or say to um, prove that you're trying to facilitate a relationship between the other parent? You know, my presentation in times like this were, um, you know, who he is when people are watching. That is the the parent that my children deserve. Um, that is the parent that I want for them, that I crave for them. But unfortunately, that's not our reality. It's very short-lived, and it's only when there's a camera on or there is an audience. Um, but who this person is behind closed doors um, is the person that I am fearful of, and and that is his baseline. You know, that's, you know, I was originally charmed by that um, presentation that everybody is seeing in these supervised vision, supervised visits uh, reports. Um, that's the person I fell in love with. And that's the person I thought I was getting married to or having children with. Um, but that's not the reality day to day that that I you know, lived or that my children lived. And so I'm I'm looking for ways to ensure that my children know their father because I know what an important role a father plays in his child's life. But I am looking for ways to keep them safe and and supervise visits are a way that we can accomplish all of these things. So you know, really making a case for that, you know, would have been and was um, my goal. And then showing all of the ways um, that you have been facilitating a relationship. So, you know, I don't know what type of protection orders are in place. With me, I did not have a, um, like a, a order of protection, a restraining order. So for me, I was able to email updates on the children. Um, if Halloween, you know, happened and he didn't see the kids on Halloween, I would send over photos of the kids in their Halloween costumes, just saying, hey, you know, I, I wanted to make sure you had a picture from this year's Halloween. Um, you know, she was Lottie the ladybug and Sarah was a pumpkin, you know, something like that. Um, I have other pictures. Let me know if you want me to send over a few things like that that show who you are as a co-parent um, because so many people get into that gray rock mentality that this court order protects me. I don't have to, or I shouldn't say that. You don't ever want to violate a court order, obviously. And all of these things, again, check with your attorney before you make 
any decisions or new strategies implemented. Um, but, you know, for me, it was not allowing him to and who he was to affect my presentation. If I take him out of the equation and I was paired with a healthy co-parent, I would be an amazing co-parent. Um, I'm great at communication. I'm flexible. I, you know, all of those things. I want to show the court in my writing, in my communication, in my presentation, who I am with him out of the picture. You know, so many those those things tend to bleed together and it affects how the court sees us. And so keeping that in mind is so important. Um, let's see, I'm trying to read the comments and... Uh, um, okay, so question number two, can you explain how to play the I know my truth game for a young child being gaslit? I have exciting news on this topic. I am writing a book series for kids. That is my 2022 goal. I have all kinds of books in mind for this series. Um, I have a, a very amazing psychologist that I look up to tremendously and she has often um, offered to come on board and help me kind of as a co-author, help me navigate this. And one of the things that I'm going to be talking about is the I Know My Truth. Um, and so this is a game for those of you who don't know, um, who, you know, when my kids were little and my ex was constantly gaslighting them or playing games with their mind or planting memories that were not true. Um, you know, remember that time when mommy was so mean to you when we were going out to breakfast and I was like, I, I don't remember that mommy. I don't know that mommy has ever been mean to you. <laughs> like, but those are the things the narcissist does. And when children are really little, um, it's really scary. And so, um, I would play a game with my daughters that, you know, obviously any communication I had with them had nothing to do with their dad. I never brought him into the equation. But an example, when my kids were like three and five, I would say, um, hey, Sarah, um, let's play I Know My Truth game. And I would always let them know that that's what we were doing because I didn't ever want to gaslight them. And so um, I would say, look, the sky is green. And she would say, I know my truth, the sky is blue. And I would say, look, your shirt is yellow. And she would say, I know my truth, my shirt is red. And so we would do this back and forth. And um, they loved playing this game. And, you know, we would do things like that. We would do role playing um, for how to handle situations with maybe a bully at school. But all of those things, even though you're not discussing the unhealthy parent, um, you are still educating them on toxic behavior, on these situations in general, so that when it does come up, whether it is a bully on the playground or an unhealthy teacher um, or their unhealthy parent, you know, they have this toolbox that is filled to the brim and they recognize unhealthy behavior. So, those are things that um, I used to do often with my kids. So it's a really powerful game. And, you know, um, even with older kids, you know, these things can be adapted to them. You know, if somebody, you know, using everyday examples that something from school, a social scenario, um, something that the two of you saw on TV or read in a book, you know, talking about without using terms like gaslighting, um, you know, that when somebody, you know, when you know your truth at such a core level, it doesn't matter what anyone says, your truth is your truth. And you have to stand so firm in that. So having these conversations with our kids are, are really important. Um, 
And then question number three. And, and again, I want to, I always invite, you know, I am not an expert on all of these things. I learn so much every single week through this work that I do um, from all of you, from your experiences, your expertise. We all, that's why I always say this is collective wisdom. If you have tips, advice, things that have worked well for you, things that haven't worked well for you, make sure you leave them in the comments um, because I welcome I welcome all input. I will never claim to have all the answers. Um, question number three, the narcissist has convinced the court that he's the victim and they are in the palm of his hand. What now? Um, so, you know, this is a common topic that we all, or a common scenario that we all come up against at some point in our battle, whether it's with a therapist that comes on board or a supervised visit monitor or the court itself. You know, there's going, and especially in that first year or two where they don't know either of you and they're stuck trying to make an assessment, you know, being really careful. Um, you know, what I will say there's so many times like that where the court gives the narcissist, maybe they're giving them the benefit of the doubt to the detriment of you or your kids or the situation, or, you know, that um, maybe things really are completely stacked in their favor. We have to keep in mind that this is very much an ultra marathon and uh, there's going to be, you know, I, I always describe my whole journey as the war and then the the little battles here and there along the way and your descriptor right there um, could have described my own journey at several different junctures um, and so so much of this becomes lifting our vision you know, realizing where we need to adjust our strategy. If you are struggling with strategy, if you're at a, a point where you just feel stuck, um, be sure to reach out to one of the coaches from um, the High Conflict Divorce Coach Certification Program. They can be found at um, myhighconflictdivorcecoach.com. These are all people who have trained directly. I am expecting that I will probably be, you know, he'll he'll probably bombard my phone with um, pictures of the girls when they were together and and how I've ruined them and everything else and the digs, the you know, the horrible things. It will spin me. I guarantee it. You know, I need someone to check my pulse if I was not triggered by my abuser blowing up my phone. So I want you to know, you know, so many people tend to put me on a pedestal and think, oh, she's this amazing warrior mom. I don't feel that way. I will tell you I'm human. And, and so if you were not triggered, if you did not have anxiety or, you know, um, be unable to get into a strategy mindset because you're under attack and you're in a battle. Um, you know, and that's where a divorce coach can be really helpful to guide you, to help you see things from different angles, different perspectives. You know, I'll often say to my clients, um, I hear what you're saying and I'm totally on board. I'm, I'm meeting you right where you're at, but I'm going to hold up a different lens which is the lens of the judge, because it's important to see things through his perspective or her perspective so that we can make sure we're exploring all of our options together. Um, those are the things that when you're like even myself, if I'm in that space where I am triggered, um, I might have to reach out to one of my close friends who has also been through this and say, okay, I'm spun right now. How do I handle this? What, what Help me get back on track. Help, help me, um, you know, I'm recentering myself. I'm, you know, regulating, but um, help me look at this from different angles. So, you know, there's no rule book for this and we're all doing the best we can. But just keep in mind that you're going to hit lots of, of junctures where it does feel, and maybe everything is completely in his favor or her favor. Um, there's nothing final. You can turn it around, um, and a lot of it just becomes going, okay, this happened. This was not what we wanted. Um, 
And, and I'm allowed to be angry and I'm allowed to be mad and frustrated and all of those things. And he, when I'm going to be this way for three days, that's my deadline. And then I'm going to dust myself off and I'm going to, you know, get myself centered and, and think of this again strategically. And how do I continue to show up and present myself as the healthy co-parent, the healthy parent that I am and, and, you know, tackle it that way until it shifts again. And I'm back in, you know, um, under a positive spotlight in the court. Um, so just know that there's lots and lots of ups and downs and there will be times where you know, it doesn't feel like it's going in your favor, you know, and, and so make sure, um, you know, always be assessing what tools you have in your toolbox, your team, um, make sure you have joined, you know, the, the state chapters of One Mom's Battle, um, you know, all of those things I'm reading. Yeah, Gigi says the mask will slip. Document diligently. Document everything and then document more. Um, it is so critical. And uh, Lisa says it's hard when worried about the kids' outcomes. Absolutely. And that's where, you know, if you want to take me off track and um, off center, it's, you know, when it involves my kids, their livelihood, what's potentially happening to them. I mean, even on this last round of court for us, we we aren't in family court. Um, my husband has adopted my daughters. We're, we have no business being in family court, yet we've recently had minors counsel appointed. I mean, it would be like going into one of my neighbor's houses who are happily married and say, hey, we're going to give you minors counsel uh, for your kids. And you're going, wait, what? Like, am I in the twilight zone? What is happening? Um, so, you know, you, you're just, you're at the mercy. Nature intended for you to protect your kids. You walk into this courtroom, this court system, and it's almost like they tie your hands behind your back and take over your job as a parent. And boy, you know, talk about loss of control. And when your children are dependent on you to protect them and your hands are tied behind your back by this broken system, it's pain and despair, you know, like nothing I've ever experienced before. So I, I completely get you where you're at right now. Um, all right, everyone. Happy Friday. I love connecting with all of you and uh, it's one of my favorite parts of the whole week. So um, thank you all for being here and uh, I hope you have a wonderful, relaxing, peaceful weekend. That's what I wish for everybody. I just recently posted something about winter solstice Solstice, and uh, taking the time to, you know, go in and, you know, take inventory and heal and um, as much as you can. I know that's easier said than done. The narcissist spirals during the holidays and uh, just keep your seatbelt fastened, helmet on if needed. And uh, we'll see you next week. Bye, everyone.